Good evening and welcome to AES Melbourne and to Collas Collingwood. My name is Graham Huon. One of the key aspects of game audio production that is seldom covered is how we deal with our assets. There are various approaches for the creation of sounds, but often the raw source material is not part of that conversation. Tonight we will investigate just how extensive this topic can be and just how it can be managed. Game manufacturers need lots of sound effects. How do they do this? For example, the game is the sound of a weapon operating. Years ago, the bang of a gunshot was sufficient, but today, game studios and movie producers alike need a more intimate uh, and engaging experience. For game production, this is more critical as the gamer is using the weapon. For a gun, sounds of loading, operating, injecting are needed to add realism, and these need context-appropriate acoustics. What brand and model of weapon was being used? They each have individual sounds. Video production has rendered a lever action Winchester rifle in detail down to the model number. Can you use your Smith & Wesson revolver sound effect you used last time? Tonight's session will be given by Stephen Schultz. Steve, uh, sorry, Stephen. Stephen has worked in the game industry for over 24 years producing sound effects, libraries and managed the organisation and implementation of literally hundreds of thousands of sounds in various formats. In nearly 20 years of audio production, Stefan has created content for every available game platform, created content for some well-known franchises and he even literally wrote the manual for FMOD Studio, one of the two main platforms for game and movie sound creation. He has also authored an important book on audio production for ARVR 3C video. I'd like you to welcome Stefan tonight to uh, this session. And uh, we'll, what we'll do with questions is if you can use the chat facilities, if you're not on site, we'll pick up the questions from the chat facilities. The session is being live streamed on our YouTube channel and you can find details of that on our website. Our thanks also go to Jason Torrens, Will Petz and the team at Collards for helping with tonight's presentation. So I'd now like to introduce Stefan to tell us all about assets. Thank you, Graham. Um, actually, really, just, just before I get in, an off-topic one, literally from last night, um, my wife and I were watching a, a documentary on life on Earth. Really big production thing. You know, it's Steven Spielberg producing this. It's got Morgan Freeman doing the narration. And then some dinosaurs walk on screen. And it's that camel sound, which I'm sure most of us are aware of, that's been used in film and television dozens and dozens of times. And it's like, this is a huge budget production. And they've just, just grabbed a sound effect out of sound effect library. Now, I suspect I could probably understand why, but we might go delve into some of that as, as part of this, this talk. Um, because I think these sorts of decisions do get made for various reasons. Uh, same sort of decision as why people keep using the Wilhelm scream, and I really wish the whole world would just stop using the Wilhelm scream. It's, it's just... It, we would all be better off without it, but that's just me. All right, um, so assets, creation, collection, implementation, administration, archiving. We're going to swim around in this sort of a field. It'll be backwards and forwards a little bit. Um, all right, so I want to start with a little bit of context and background. A uh, few of you might know who I am. Some of you won't. Um, and a little bit of context will help. Uh, we'll start with this context because it actually builds up kind of why I've sort of understood and gone in various different directions with things. Um, so the first piece of context, which is very, very important, is I have no idea what I'm doing. And that's somewhat problematic from the point of view of me being here and speaking to you tonight. Um, and there's, there's a reason for this. I have... No formal education in this. I went to VCA as an instrumental musician. I then spent five years in the Australian Army Band as an instrumental musician. I then went, oh, I want to do something else. And I went to La Trobe, and that was a bit of technical stuff. Like, there was a room with a mixing desk in it. Um, and I got to use a, a DAT, a digital audio tape deck. Um, but my, my education wasn't about any of the stuff that I ended up doing. Uh, unlike a lot of my colleagues in America who, you know, I talk to them and they're like, oh, yeah, 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 you know, my mentor was this really important Hollywood film composer or this really important Hollywood sound designer. And I'm like, what's a mentor? Like, you know, in Australia, we actually don't have much of a, a tradition of mentoring the same way. So I am self-taught. And so there's been some interesting ways in which I've gone about doing things. 
And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of you in this room tonight and be like, he does what? Oh, good Lord. And, you know, some of you might want to be sort of offering me, you know, some therapy later on because of the way I've adopted things. So, so this is very much how I've done things for right or wrong. Um, so my first gig was actually when I f was just wrapping up the course at La Trobe University and I had a friend contact me and he said, oh, yeah, a couple of years ago at a party, you said you wanted to work in games. I'm like, I don't even remember that conversation. And I wasn't drunk because I don't really drink that much. It's just a conversation I didn't remember. And he's like, can you come in tomorrow? Okay, great. And I went and met these people and back and forth. And they originally wanted me to be a composer. And then they basically wanted to, so just sort of on contract. And then I think the guy who owned the company decided he was going to employ me full time because he realized that he was only going to pay me less than what I get paid at McDonald's. And so that was a good deal for him. Um, and so, but I had a job working in the game industry. Great. And my list of duties were quite literally sourcing, creating all the sound effects, composing all the music, implementing both of these things, editing all the voiceover, creating and editing the video content because video has sound in it, you know. So therefore, I was the most qualified person in the company to also learn how to do vi video rendering and editing and lots of stuff. I knew nothing about that. I'd never opened a video editing program in my life, but that was another responsibility. The, the, the really, really lovely one is the bottom one. The first game I worked on was a real-time strategy game. It was based on the Starship Troopers movie. And they went, oh, we want you to work out all the, the, the balance for the units. So how many hit points they've got and how much damage all the guns do. Uh, do and, 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 and this in most games is incredibly complex. And there's usually massive spreadsheets to work out all this. The reason why they thought I'd be good at this is because I occasionally played war games. Therefore, again, I was the most qualified person. This entire first gig was a rodeo but I wasn't actually on a horse. I was on a pissed off rhinoceros. And that's kind of what it felt like. So part of this, obviously, with the sound design was, all right, well, how do you do sound design? I guess I need to have some raw assets. Great. What do I do? What have I got uh, as far as resources? Nothing. In fact, to put it into context, the studio back then was using Pentium 4s. That's just where they were on the, on the, on the time scale. And they had an old Pentium 1 in the closet that they literally just went, oh, you can do that because we don't want to spend any money on you. So they, they didn't spend any money in that first year. They didn't buy me any equipment. I was on a computer that could not run the game properly and took five hours to compile the game. Um, and so there were no assets for anything. I had one of the programmers there say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm an ex-RMIT student, but I still do stuff there, like, and I've got my RMIT library card, and RMIT has a sound effects library. Here's my library card. They won't check whether you're me. Go and borrow these. So I literally was <laughs> whenever I went to RMIT going, hi, I want to borrow these li libraries. So basically borrowed some libraries, and they were all the old sound ideas, Series 6000, Series 1000 and 2000, and even then, this is the year 2000, even then, these were awful. These were really, really, really very, very basic. And I'm pretty sure that's where that camel sound I was talking about before was in that library somewhere. There's the mechanical door we've all heard. Like these are cliched sounds, which I listened to and went, I, I've heard half of these on television already. And so I've got to try and work out sort of how to make sounds out of these. But I didn't know how to do any of this. I had a copy of Cool Edit that a friend had gotten me, right? So this is what I'm doing. And, and I've never done sound design. I knew that in Cool Edit, you could layer things up and that's cool. But I, so I opened sound design and I put a sound in and went, cool, there's all these buttons. There's buttons for reverb and buttons for flanges and buttons for, for chorus and stuff. I don't know what any of those mean. Nobody's ever told me what a chorus is. Nobody's ever told me kind of how reverb works, but there's all these presets. So I just started pressing presets on sounds going, well, it doesn't sound any better than it did before. It just sounds kind of echoey or it sounds kind of muddy or whatever. And so literally I'm, I'm having to teach myself sound design by going, oh, pressing all these preset buttons really isn't the magic trick. So I learned that fairly quickly. I then had to work out how on earth to do sound design. We might get into that later on. I was also, I sort of said, well, I, I need to get some more assets. And I'm like, oh, okay, look, go and hire some equipment for a couple of days and, and use that. And so I went to, ooh, who was it? Pink Audio still exists? It was Pink Audio back then. They were lovely. They were really, really lovely. They, they, they rented me a portable DAT, and I knew what a portable DAT was because I'd used one at La Trobe University, and a shotgun microphone, and I can't remember it was the one whether I ended up getting on... It might have been. I think it was a Sennheiser MKH-60 um, because I ended up getting... Work ended up buying one of those on the second project, um, 
And so I had that and I, and I, I literally, I went around and I found a building site and I kicked over piles of bricks and uh, like, like the, not the proper ones, but the, like the, the rubble stuff that they were throwing away and recorded that sort of stuff. So I had very basic equipment. I had to make some assets. I had to capture some raw material. I had to then try and turn that raw material into, you know, so, oh, if I combine the, the, the recording I have of the wood and then I combine the what, bricks next to each other and I layer those up together, oh, look, it sounds like the house has fallen over. Yay. And it was the, literally the sort of stuff that you teach first-year students. I'm doing professionally. Now, I wasn't getting paid very much, so maybe that figure... No, I don't know that that works out either, but anyway... So yeah, look, it was, it was Cool Edit and guesswork. A lot of what I did. Now, one of the things I will say about Cool Edit, uh, so that was the year 2000. We're now in 2020, 2024. I use Cool Edit today. I use Cool Edit almost every single day, and I use it for one very, very good reason. It's stable, and it works, and it's fast. So um, if I need to literally do, uh, I just need to resample some stuff, I put it in Cool Edit, and like I can go through a whole stack of dialogue and just go cut, cut, copy that, bit, put it in there, uh, change the sample rate, save it out, done. And I, I, I use Reaper, I've used Nuendo and, and other tools, but there is something really, really, really valuable about having a simple piece of software that just does what you need it to do. So a 25, 26, 27 year old piece of software is something I use all the time because of that. And it is brilliant. The guesswork, I suspect I'm still doing a lot of that too. So the second project I got, uh, uh, like, so we got the Starship Trippers game out and that all worked somehow. And then the next one was basically uh, another film franchise one, and they basically went, oh, you're going to really need to do some more recording for this. So they bought me an NKH60, which was really, really nice. Quite a good microphone. I've still got one. Uh, I've got one of my own. I don't use it these days because, to be honest, these days it feels a little bit muddy compared with more modern microphones, but its side cancellation was great, and I loved it. And I recorded all sorts of animals and stuff like that, which was really good because the game we were working on was a Jurassic Park game, and I had to make all of the dinosaurs and that was lots of fun but again i'm like eh, what i'm doing and I, I i very quickly discovered that recording birds was easy and slowing birds down was one of the best things for doing creature sounds ever in fact well, let's make that mark here right now there are three main tools that i use for sound design uh pitch is one of them and i use it all the time and and pitch manipulation is just brilliant um so slowing birds down etc etc but the other thing that was with this and the whole I don't know what I'm doing was I was creating music assets and because it was a film franchise, I had to go out and I had to get some samples that sounded like orchestra because of Hollywood film. And back then, the only thing that existed was a set of CDs of samples and that was the Peter Sedlicek uh, orchestral sample library there was one cd and that was all of the violins you look at spitfire libraries now and you think that this was in the entire string section on one cd and it's just terrifying and so it's five cds one for winds one for strings one for brass one for percussion and one for something else um and so i was writing some music and um then the, um, the production team, uh, the producers in America were like, well, we need to, obviously, this is a big film franchise. We need to check that the music you're writing is appropriate. So I sent them some of the music, and they're like, actually, we don't mind what you're writing. That's pretty good. But those CD samples, those samples sound really bad. I'm like, well, I can go out and try and find some better quality samples. And they're like, oh, no, 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 you misunderstand what we're saying. Go get a real orchestra. And I'm like, what? They're like, we've got the budget. Go get a real orchestra. I'm like, like, actual, like, people or playing instruments in an orchestra. They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, go get a quote for us and we'll, we'll, we'll tell you. And like, I didn't really know where to look and I reached out to one, one thing just to get a quote. I thought I'll start with a quote. Uh, and, and I didn't have that much experience of who to contact or whatever. So I just went, all right, well, that's something that obviously I know. I'll get a quote for them. Okay, that's a lot of money. Let's see what they think. They're like, yep, that's great. Off you go. I'm like, so you're happy with Melbourne Symphony? They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Go, go, go record, do a couple of recording sessions with Melbourne Symphony. And I'm like, so I got to write all this music to be performed by orchestral musicians. And they're like, yeah. All right, great. What I didn't tell them is I've never done a composing course, a day of composing course in my life. I've never done orchestration. I've never done scoring. And I went out and bought a book on scoring and again had to teach myself how to do all of this over the two months whilst I was writing an hour worth of music for Melbourne Symphony. More assets, more questions, a lot more guesswork. Um... And so this was, this was literally a crash course. This was all over the course of a couple of years. Um, and 
sincerest apologies, Jason, and to everybody else here who's involved with the institutions. I learned more in those two years of necessity than I learned in three to six years of the various different courses I'd done at university. <laughs> and I'm not trying to downplay the courses. It was literally just... It was like, hmm, I'm hanging from a rope on the side of a mountain. I'm going to learn how to abseil right now or I'm going to die. And it was a little bit like that. And, and it is one of those things that sometimes I sort of think we should get um, students halfway through a course and just grab them and just throw them into a random industry. I don't know, a metal smelter. It doesn't matter whether it's related to your course. Throw them, you know, they're, they're now, they're now a, a country vet for like a cattle farm just so that they have to deal with the real world. Because the real world has challenges in it that... Uh, we can't manufacture it in, in an institution. It's, it's almost impossible. You know what I mean? It's just like you can talk about it, but it's, it just doesn't work talking about the, what's going to happen and what might happen and the potential of what could happen. You can talk about it in the classroom and the kids will be like, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Whereas if you throw them out to the real world, they'd be like, oh, my Lord, you were right. Anyway. And so asset management was really important. Who'd have thunked it? And, and especially with games, because one of the things about games is I'd have my raw assets. So at that stage, I was probably working 44, 16, uh, mono and stereo, and that's fine. But then, you know, at one point, somebody said, oh, right, right, for this game um, on, on the Xbox, uh, we need it to be ADPCM. I'm like, what now? What, what's ADPCM? It's a compression format. What's a compression? Like, again, what's a compression format? It's like, well, we're going to be compressing your, your, your sound assets to make them smaller so they take up less memory, blah, 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 blah. I'm like... Oh, okay, what's that now? So again, having to learn the formats that we needed. And at that stage, it was all again, just like everything's on fire all the time. We've all seen the meme with the dog in the fire. This is all fine. Um, that's been my life and most of my career. And so asset management is really important because I'd have to go, okay, here's all my raw stuff and I need to keep that separate. And now I've actually done them in here. And oh, now what I need to keep in mind is I need to be basically going, all right, well, here's all the... I don't know, the sounds for the T-Rex, and I've done those, and I've put them into the game, and then somebody says, well, we don't really like those three. Okay, so now what I need to be doing is doing versioning, so I need to go, okay, so the T-Rex Raw number one, which was just called T-Rex Raw, because at, at the time I didn't know I'd be having more of those, I need to do an updated version, but I need to keep track of the updated version, so now I've got T-Rex Raw version two, didn't have a version one, but I guess we understand that, and, and so all of a sudden it's not just... I've got different formats from raw to stereo ones, which sound nice because we might need the nice stereo ones for the video that we're doing for uh, pre-rendered stuff and for marketing, but the ones that are going in the game are mono, so I'll need to actually, oh, I'm going to need to start actually labeling them T-Rex score underscore stereo, T-Rex score underscore mono, wait, go back, T-Rex score, T-Rex raw version two underscore stereo, T-Rex raw version two underscore, and so you're getting into all of this sort of, you know, how you're going to be doing things. All right, so that's a lot of just frenetic, welcome to the inside of my mind. It's, just trust me when I try to go to sleep, it's a big challenge. <laughs> there are a whole bunch of tools, and one of the things that's really, really important is that we do not underestimate them. And I actually decided it might be a little bit fun to have a little bit of uh, show and tell here. So I bought some stuff in. This is one of my boxes. It's got a lot of things in it. And oh, actually, oh, I do have it. And there's a reason why. Uh, in fact, Nick, this might have been, uh, I think you introduced me to this uh, many, many years ago. So I had some recording devices, and I'll talk about them a little bit at the time. Um, and then Nick introduced me to, you've got a Nagra, don't you? Yeah, so you, Nick introduced me to his Nagra, and I'm like, wow, that's really nice. It's got multi-channel. It's got, it's got really nice preamps. It's really, really cool. Um, and, and all of a sudden, weirdly, I'm talking to people. I'm like, yeah, look, I've seen the Nagra. They're a bit expensive. I'm thinking of getting a sound devices, uh, one of the sound devices units. And all of a sudden, I had people going, yeah, I've got one of those. Sorry, what do you mean you got one of those? Yeah, I got one of those. I occasionally record bands. I'm like, it's a four thousand dollar recorder. What do you mean you got one of those and you occasionally? And I bump into somebody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just for, just for as a hobby. Sometimes I just do some recording, you know, of birds and stuff like that. So I've got one of those as well. Like, so I'm doing this professionally, and I'm trying to make up my mind as to what I'm going to buy. And I'm bumping into people who own multiple thousands of dollars digital recording devices, just kind of cause. And it was really weird for me seeing people spending so much money because I've always been super careful about where I spend my money because I have to be. I run my own business. It's essentially due diligence of what, where I spend my money on, on stuff. So I started, I'll actually start with the, the, the very original one. 
I lived in Japan for three years, and for 12 months of that, I lived in Tokyo. And one day I walked into, there was an arcade of lots of different shops, and there, there was literally an audio shop. And I'd, like, I'd always walk past and sort of drool in the window at all these very expensive microphones and stuff. And one day I walked past and there was this. And I was like, what the hell is that? And I walked inside and in very bad Japanese basically said, what the hell is that? And they're like, oh, yeah, that's, um, that's from um, uh, Eddie Roll, which is basically part of Roland. It's a digital recorder. And I'm like... Oh my lord! It's it's a small recording device. I like I normally cram around a portable DAT that's this big and the size of a. Oh, you don't even know what phone books are anymore, you people. Um, <laughs> and, and I looked at this and I was like, this was quite amazing. And and what was surprising about this is it's actually a really cool design in that like you've got this little thing that pops down like that and that's where your SD card goes and then there's another little tab that you pop and when you pop that the whole thing opens up to put the batteries in. Really, really cool design. Um, and surprisingly, the, the, the microphones on the side are surprisingly wind resistant. Like I'd have this outside on days when there was more than no, no breeze at all, and it was pretty good. So I got one of these, and I, I potted around, and, and that was really nice. But it wasn't earth-shaking. I mean, it wasn't one level in that it was a, a handheld recorder I could keep on me. This was groundbreaking. And there are going to be some people who may even laugh at it. This was groundbreaking. It was utterly groundbreaking. And one of the main reasons why this was utterly groundbreaking is because it was exactly the same thing. A digital recorder, you could put an SD card in there, you could put batteries in there. It had built-in microphones, but it had XLR slots in the bottom. I could plug stuff into it. And you can see how I evolve the way I was going to use this thing. This is then its newer brother, which I'll get to in a second. And so it had this little plate with the, with the Velcro on it, and it had a, a, like a normal thread screw on the back of it. I'm like, whoa, I got a boom pole, and I can hook it into that with my microphone, and then I got a better microphone, and I've updated that, and oh, I can put it on a tripod. And so this, this is one of the most significant things in my career. We'll get to the other next significant thing in my career in a little bit. But this, I bought this when I lived in Japan, and I recorded so much stuff that ended up being the basis for Sound Librarian and all the sounds that, that basically started off our whole catalogue. And then over the years, I updated to um, uh, the... It, this is So that's the H4, and that's the H4N, which is the new version. And that's a second one which I got, because I was so happy with it. Also because that... See that one there? That's got a crack on the screen. That's got a crack on the screen. It's not on this slide, it's on the next slide. Because I Velcroed it to the bottom of a skateboard and then told somebody to go and ride the skateboard. And I got amazing sounds. Break the screen. But see, here's the whole point of what I'm talking about with uh, care less about the equipment. Because I've had people go, and, and, and they are correct, I've had people go, oh, why would you want to zoom? The, the preamps on zooms are really crappy. You know, you need to be using an $8,000 sound devices system or an $8,000 Nagra system. And on one level, they are correct. With all things being equal. Like if we've got, if we've got the ability to do that. On one level, they're incorrect, and I'll show you one of the best devices that I have, and that's the H1, which is the cheapest, pretty much the cheapest thing they made for a while. And I had people look at this and go, you've got to be kidding, it's a toy. Yeah, it is a toy, uh, and it's really, really small, and it fits perfectly into the leg pocket of a flight suit of a Spitfire pilot. And I've got recordings of inside of a Spitfire and a Mustang and a Gloucester Meteor and a Korean Sabre jet and a Hudson bomber and a Catalina whilst they're flying because this, I could walk up and say, hey, can you put that in your pocket? And it would, it would lock so that it wouldn't turn off and it wouldn't change its settings. And the pilot would go, oh, sure, yeah, no problem. This is after negotiating with the airfield, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas if I said, hey, I've got this rig and can I bolt this to the outside of you? No. And that's the thing. This is what I mean about getting the job done. This is a $150 device was infinitely better than a $10,000 Nagra or, or sound devices thing because it allowed me to get recordings inside of a Spitfire that otherwise the option was this or nothing. So anytime anybody gets uh, to be a gear snob or elitist about equipment, I will shut them down in a heartbeat because I have gotten some really good stuff out of some... Fairly basic equipment, fairly basic. And you can see there, I've gone through playing around with things. Now this, um, there's an updated version of this set up here with that there. And that for uh, 18 months while I was recording those airplanes was priceless because I'd put good quality batteries into that and I'd get about six hours of recording in stereo on good quality batteries and I'd have that set up like that. And then when I got permission to go to the airfield, before the show started, I'm like, can I put this at the end of the runway? Like, well, you're not going to be with it? I'm like, no. 
No, because you can't have any body out there when the planes are flying, but you can have a little tripod sit out there for six hours whilst there are Spitfires and Sabre jets flying 10 feet above the thing. And so I'm standing where it's safe for me to, with one rig, and they're, they're going... Rum, 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 ring. And so I get one perspective. There. I mean, this is talking, you know, different mic perspectives, except the mic, the, the mic I've got in my hand is here, and this is literally half a kilometre away down the end of the runway. And in fact, when, when I went to a, a, a bigger, one of their bigger air shows, I literally had one at each end of the runway um, because this is a self-contained unit. I mean, if, if you know, that you, if you test it and you know, I can get four or five hours out of the battery in this, you switch it on, put it down, leave it. I mean, nobody's going to be out at the end of a runway. If somebody actually ran out there to steal that, there's going to be people who are going to leap on them because the end of a runway at an airport is a, sec a security zone. I got permission from them to take it down there. They, they escorted me down there in their little buggy. I put it out there and at the end of the day, I say, can I collect it? Great. This, I have done so much with this. I put it next to race courses. I've done all sorts of things. So again, not big expensive equipment that I'm worried about being stolen or if it rains. If this thing gets wet, okay, that's unfortunate, but it's three or $400, not three or $4,000. So again, this strapped to a bottom of a skateboard. If it gets a break, broken screen, okay. So there are times when the less expensive stuff is, is really, really valuable. Right, so strap the uh, uh, wrong way. Strap to a skateboard. Um, I'll get to these two in a second. Um, this one is one I carry around with my bag uh, all the time now. Sony S10, I think. They don't make these anymore. I, I have no idea. Sony have got this habit of making really good products and then they stop making them because reasons. Um, now, the second thing that was the most significant thing in my career as far as recording audio is not so much this device, but it's what it represents. This. Also has two, only two, but this is 32-bit. And if you're recording and you're not using 32-bit, start using 32-bit. This The 32-bit is, I uh, hate this because it's so cliche, but it really is uh, uh, like evolutionary and game-changing from the point of view of, there, there are recordings I have on some of the other ones where literally I, I was, whenever I was using these other ones and my, my, even my, my sound devices one, quite often I'd be writing the levels, etc. because, you know, oh, you know, oh the, the, the jet's over there. Cool, I can barely hear it. And then it takes that jet about two and a half seconds to be back flying overhead, and if you don't get your levels down, I mean, I did, I did do splits for different levels and stuff, but 32-bit is just amazing. This is fantastic. Look how small that is. It's like two, two inputs. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's big brother. Oh, actually, it's big, or big sibling. Uh, is this one. That's the F6. And one thing I will say is I agree wholeheartedly. When Zoom started, their preamps were not very good. Zoom's preamps now are very good. Considering that this is about $1,000, so if you talk, I've got a sound devices, 788, which is $6,500. Right now, I'd buy six of these rather than one of those because I'm not recording a symphony orchestra that, that the quality needs to be this good. I'm recording raw sounds that I'm then going to be processing and layering up 20 times anyway. Um, I'm recording howitzers and, and tanks. And, and so, so, you know, uh, are, the, are the preamps oh, that much better? Really? And, and that's one of the things about this thing. I literally had somebody say, oh, but the preamps aren't very good. It's like, have you ever heard the inside of a Spitfire when it's flying? For a start, it's very, very loud. And secondly, it's like having your head in a really, really noisy tumble dryer. Slightly noisy preamps? The, 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 I... Initially, when I did this, so this has a, a, a range from 99 being its maximum input down to one. And initially, I, it was peaking. Weirdly, shortly after that, I started doing this. Zoom actually released a, a, a BIOS update for this that allowed you to go down to 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, and I literally have this on 0 0.1. 0 0.1. So 0 0.1 of its maximum range of, of input when I put it in Spitfire, and even then, the WAV form is like that. That's why a 32-bit sort of thing would be, would be brilliant. So the other thing is, as you can see, I'm, I'm fairly boisterous and I kind of like what I do. The best results, you can't fake doing this job. This, do you know why this happened? Because my wife and I went for a, 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 a few days holiday up into the Highlands, up near Myrtleford and Bright, uh, this is many, many years ago, and I always take my recording gear with me. My wife's completely happy with that because she's a writer. She's like, oh, I'm just going to sit and write <laughs> while you do whatever. And we went for a drive, and as we drove past, there was uh, getting closer to Aubrey, there was this, this park there, and there was all these 
old men with old steam engines and, 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 and kerosene engines and all these old bits of farm machinery. And I'm just like, oh, my God, this is incredible. Like, everything's sitting there coughing and spluttering and everything like that. And then these two guys who literally had an old Bren gun carrier. And I'm like, can I go for a ride? And they're like, sure. This was not planned. This just happened because we were driving past the thing and I went, oh, my God, and we spent several hours there. I got really badly sunburned and I recorded a whole bunch of stuff. This is even more insane. This was in Adelaide and there's a mangrove swamp and I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning to go to the mangrove swamp at 4 o'clock in the morning to try and record the birds and there weren't very many birds and there was a refinery over there making noise and I was really disappointed and there was a nearby boat ramp and then some boats started going out for the early morning stuff so I had a hydrophone so I started recording the boat, the, the outboard motors and I got some pretty good ones and then I remember there was a playground just nearby where there was a flying fox and I thought I'll get the flying fox zooming backwards and forwards that'll be cool and there was this you can't see, that's that, uh, you know that kind of metal that they make the, the normal metal fences out of, you know, the, the, the crisscross mesh, you know, all the old high schools had them. And, it, and, it's, and it's, I don't know what type of metal it is, it's obviously steel, but it just goes brown. It's not rusty, it just seems to sort of oxidise and go brown. So this, this is one of those merry-go-round things made out of all of that metal. And the whole thing is literally, there's a concrete slab and there's a metal post there, right? And there was a lady with her, like, three-year-old kid on this thing, having fun and everything like that. And I'm just standing there going... Oh my God, probably looking really creepy because I've got like gear strapped to me and a microphone. And after a little bit of time, she's like, we'll go do something else. I'm like, yes, go do something else. Go away, go away. Because this was all rusty. So the whole thing was resonating. So this thing, when it spang around, would go anything from... Right? But occasionally the vibrations would build up and build up and the whole thing would just sit there going... As it was spinning around. And I recorded that thing for like half, I didn't move from that for half an hour, I'm just spinning it like some sort of insane person and recording different sounds from it. And I've used that sound in a whole bunch of things. And weirdly, it was only just recently, like in the last week that I realized, because one of the things out of the sound libraries that I produce, they, they've been used by people all over the world. They've been sold and used to different studios. And I did know that Weta had bought them years ago, but I never, I never get to find out what people had used them in. And then recently for something else, I looked up the sound of the giant spaceship in District 9. It does it like a giant blam sound. The tail end of that blam is that. And there is nobody else in the world that's recorded that in that regard. So I suspect that that was one of my sounds got layered into that thing. So for once, I actually got some evidence of where one of my sounds was used. So that was kind of fun. Um, but this is the whole point. I didn't plan on getting that. I didn't plan on getting that. I did plan on getting that, but, you know, that was a separate thing. But... This is just me being kind of crazy, enjoying what I do. And it's a, that's how you're going to get the best work. Uh, just a quick look at time because I'll talk forever. Um, quick thing on formatting. As you can see, there's lots of them. Why on earth would I go this far? Anybody got any ideas why on earth I would go this far? Am I, have I all of a sudden become a weird audiophile that cares about, I care about 192 kilohertz because I want everything. Anybody got any ideas? Pitch shifting. Dynamic range. Yes. Manipulation. Yeah. Well, because basically somebody informed me of, uh, oh, if you don't hear, do you do sound design here? Yeah. yeah do you have a Sanken C100K? No. Buy one. No. Literally, buy one for the, oh, the institution. Okay. Seriously. Uh, it's three and a half grand. It's worth literally every single cent. The reason why it's called C100K, because it records up to 100K, right? as in frequencies of 100K. So your sample rate needs to be this to capture those. And this is, this is a trick. Skywalker Sound has had one of these for years and the bastards kept it secret because this is one of the most amazing. Like, once you know how this thing works, you go, oh, that's where all of your Godzilla sounds have come from. Half of your monster sounds come, come from. The, the first thing I did with this was literally just a metal rubbish bin out the front of our house. And I just thought, I'll test this out. And I kicked the metal rubbish bin and rattled it a little bit and then dropped it down eight octaves. And it literally sounds like the hull of the Titanic being kicked in by Godzilla. The things you can do with that microphone are godly, but you do need something capable of recording at that. But it is an incredible piece of equipment. But so all of these formats are relevant for different reasons. Um, Ambisonic. Yeah, let's get to that. So this is my current rig. This is the Rode NTSF1. Ambisonic microphone. That's the Zoom F6. It takes six channels. I've got four in there for Ambisonic format. Uh, that is my that is my current ambience recording rig. I use that for everything that is an ambience, 
My other rig is a Rode shotgun microphone that has the C100K in it and the Sankin CS1E shotgun microphone. I've jury rigged the whole thing to have two, sh two shotgun mics in and they, they go into things because that means I get the good... Uh, the C, uh, CS1E is a nice directional one. And the um, fancy frequency one is... is um, uh, uh, Omni. Omni, thank you. Um, but this one, I capture everything in Ambisonic. Somebody here asked me how often I use Ambisonic as a format. Go on. Sorry, how often do you use it as a format? <laughs> Sorry. Well done. Uh, never. Yeah. Okay. No. Well, okay. Very, 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 very seldom. But the whole thing about Ambisonic is Ambisonic is glorious from ambiences because it captures the spherical field and it really, really well collapses down to quad, stereo, mono, and, and it's really, really... So, so it's essentially... Essentially, I'm capturing in the highest resolution... And in this case, not just the highest resolution of 192 kilohertz, although I think that, one's, that one has to be set up to, for 96. It won't go any higher because of using all the channels. But 96 kilohertz, 32 bit. So those are the highest sample rate resolutions and bit rate resolutions. And Ambisonic is the highest, I guess, spatial, spatial resolution. Yeah. And so, and, and the point about this is because this is uh, this has got a like 150 gig hard drive or whatever. This at the moment is half full of just nothing from our balcony because every time there's even the slightest hint of thunder, like I, like if I, I, I'm tuned that in the middle of the night, if I hear a rumble, I wake up, I will take this outside, I'll put it on our balcony, and I'll go back to sleep because I have got and and I literally have hours and hours and hours of footage off this that I just need to sift through. We're, and it's really easy when I'm looking for thunder because it's literally nothing, blam, nothing. So it's easy to just vis visually find it. Um, and because really good thunder is worth its weight in gold. But this, as my, my ambience rig, is ready to go. Um, we, I, I've had this thing where I've basically switched it on in the middle of the night, come back later on and gone, oh, whoops, I forgot to turn it off. And it's going 14 hours later and it's chugging along because these big old Sony batteries work forever. Um, so, yeah, so that's good. Uh, all right, let's jump on quickly. Uh, naming conventions. Largest to smallest, in case you don't know it. Car, Ford, Laser, 1980, door, open, 06. The reason why is because all of the car sounds end up being together, and then all the car Ford sounds end up being together, and then all the car Ford Laser sounds end up being together. This is how the military names things. I did five years in the Army. I actually got something useful out of five years in the Army, a naming convention for sound effects. Um, but that, uh, we've also now got the uh, USC, US, US Universal Sound Category System, which... Uh, a, a handful of very clever people worked out. It's pretty good. So they basically have uh, the larger category the, and then they've got kind of subcategories for a few things and then they've got how you would actually um, uh, shorten it. And I use all that for all the sound libraries that I create um, that go out commercially. Um, it's good. I keep butting my head against it going, oh, no, that I, no, I don't want to put that sound layer like that. I want to put that sound there like that. And it, it, it's not perfect. I don't think anything is. But it's, it's, it's being adopted a lot, and it's actually kind of nice having uh, a, a more broadly, like we were saying, having a standard that people are adopting. So that one's actually a good one to look, uh, look out for. Again, if you don't cover that, it's probably worth looking into. Yeah, I thought, you, I thought you might. I'd be sort of surprised. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, though, uh, USCs uh, may not always be appropriate, especially for games or even film and television projects. You, you can't have really big, verbose names sometimes. So, you know, I mean, at the moment, this... Uh, I'm, these are the ones I'm working on right at the moment. SFX UC Sabre. That is Sound Effects Unit cel uh, Celestial. Actually, that should be an A because we just changed it because the, the Celestials are angels. So that actually should be SFX uh, Unit Angel Sabre. Um, whereas... Oh, and that's, so that's VO. So that's voiceover, Unit Sabre. The other one we might have is um, Structure. So if it's a sound for a structure, we would have S... A or SC, um, and so and then then that's unit human, and so basically in this particular case because we're trying to get things implemented into Unreal or Unity or whatever, you 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 quite often have code systems that you need to work with for a specific project. So there's going to be a difference between uh, the naming conventions you use for your archiving and your collections versus what you might be using for a project. And so again, that's where sometimes it's really really worth going back to. Oh, here's my aeroplane blimp. Thing, and quite often I'll rename it and put a little brackets in saying used in Sabre Tank or whatever to remind me at a glance that, oh, I use that sound effect for that thing. And the other thing I actually also do is um, 
let's uh, let's just say that was the raw sound effect for the moment, uh, and I, that's what I found in my library. Cool, SFX underscore UC underscore Saber, and then I put it into Reaper or whatever, and all I do with it is pitch shift it. I'll then save it out as pitched, and then I put in RX7, and then I'll, I'll, I'll save it out as pitched RX. Then I'll and then I'll do something else to it, and I'll pitch. And so I'll quite often put in in, in my working files actually what the the, the, the overall bulk. Um, effects and stuff like that that I'm doing to things just so that I'm keep it's almost like a paper trail in a way um, so there's uh, so the naming also gets relevant when you're doing things with like the search tools so sound miner base head then there's Nuendo's internal and Reaper's internal look I've heard all sorts of great things about sound miner and I know the guy who does base head and he made lots of money so it must be good um, I ended up just using the one that was internal to Nuendo and now I've swapped to Reaper, I just use the internal one because it's, it's like there's a built-in thing that allows me to go, I need the sound of a frog. There's all the frogs. Now, I do know people who, who use SoundMiner and they're like, yeah, but the one in SoundMiner now is almost like a door in itself where you can do all these things. It's like, I don't even know how to use most of the features in Reaper or Cool Edit yet. Like trying to then learn another thing that can do more things, it just ends up getting unwieldy. I, I keep... I, like I, at dinner when we were talking about it, I sort of said, look, I've got RX-7, I think I've got at the moment. I use the denoise feature. I use the amplitude feature. I occasionally use the, the spectral editing. It's got squillions of other functions. I don't have the time to learn to use them because most of the time I'm just keeping up with trying to get all the work done that I have to do. I will learn things as a necessity, a little bit like those first years. I need to know how to do video editing, all right? And I don't know how to use all the video editing stuff. I need to know, I need to know enough to get the job that they asked me to do done. That's probably, it's fairly lengthy, but that'd probably be a reasonable thing to put on my headstone. He learnt enough to do what he needed to get done. Um, and again, when it comes to your personal collection, that's, that's entirely up to you. Work with, with, with whatever naming convention you want. But keep in mind that if you're going to start integrating into larger systems, using the Universal One is good for that reason. It, it, it then becomes, uh, it blends. Um, I, I had a habit, I don't know even why I did this. Um, I can really, I can spot all of my sound effects because I've got the, the so Pro Sound Effects make uh, are the people who distribute my library. And because of that, they've given me access to their entire collection, which is amazing. But I can spot Mile a Mile Away because for some reason when I started doing my sound effects library and I was doing my naming convention, I, I had the thing with the Ford laser thing that I did before, of biggest to smallest. But for some reason I named all of my sound files in all caps. I don't, I don't know why. Maybe it's because I yell a lot. Um, but like, so, so uh, I'm doing any search like, yep, that's my sound because the whole sound, the whole file name's in all caps. I really don't know why I did that. Curating and archiving. Um, this is actually really, really, really important. Um, hard drives fail. They will always fail. Uh, anybody who's got any CD-ROMs that they burn? Have you checked any of them recently? You'll find that a whole bunch of them don't work anymore. One of the things that nobody talked about at the time is literally the, the, the gold, silver stuff in it literally just fades. And I'm not talking in the sun. I've got ones that are being kept in sealed containers down and you pull them out and it's just like the, there is no data on that anymore. It's literally just faded. It might be the difference between the different things. But anybody who's got stuff on CD-ROM that they care about, check it out now and back it up onto hard drives. And I, I'm actually going to say hard drives, like just the little portable hard drives, you can get them from Officeworks for a couple hundred bucks. I've got squillions of those. And the reason why I've got those is because a few years ago we thought we'd do things right and we got an NAS RAID array. And we spent a lot of money on, well, you know, we bought two of them eventually. They were three and a half grand each and then one of them failed. And no, it wasn't a single drive that failed. Two Western digital drives failed at the same time. We lost stacks of data that was really, really detrimental to our company and I will not touch Western Digital now with a 40 foot barge pole. Because they were, they were like their caviar black, like their top level server drives that were really expensive. And we had two fail. Nothing you do about it. So I do not trust servers anymore. Uh, I know people who just say, oh, I put it up on the cloud. It's like, I've got hundreds of thousands of sounds. Any of the cloud options that I've seen would be really expensive. So I literally just have hard drives and I've got, uh, my, 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 my archiving is not great. I generally have two copies of everything. And it's quite often like, well, this particular thing, which was, you know, I've got a folder full of projects, but you might find that that folder of projects have been duplicated over there, but those three from that thing have been, so quite often I've got three copies of things. And it does at times make it a little bit hard to track things down. Um, 
Do not trust uh, servers. I'm not sure about cloud. CDs fade. Even hard drives fail. So make sure that with your archiving and curating, you have a lot of backup. And don't think, oh, that project I did all those years ago, yeah, I won't care about that because that was really lame. I've had projects come up where it's like, no, that sound effect I made years ago would have been the perfect basis for a modern one. Oh, did I accidentally? Yeah, you will lose data. And yes, I did accidentally segue perfectly into that. Do not assume that old sounds are worthless. And I'm talking even really old, uh, like, you know, like one of the things Pro Sound Effects has is like old BBC recordings. Like they got the BBC archive. So I've actually got recordings of the insides of nuclear re reactors and stuff like that in Britain because BBC was just allowed to get access to things. We're BBC, let us in. You know, like, they're like the tax department. And they would just record all these things. And you listen to them, you're like, yeah, look, there's no low end on that. And it's a bit sort of MIDI and everything like that. But the thing is, when I'm doing sound design, an awful lot of my sound design is I want to make the sound of a space tank. It's going to have 20 layers in there. So that MIDI, no bass line in the middle might have that really, really lovely sort of sci-fi hum to it. And its its job as a single sound effect is not to suit all your purposes. Its job is to be a layer. It's kind of like saying, I don't really like that color red, so I'm not going to put it in this giant painting with a million other colors. It's like, it, you know, it might be the perfect thing mixed in with everything else. And so again, don't assume that any of your older assets and your older recordings are not valuable because you quite possibly find that they really, really are. So that's another reason to archive your stuff well, keep track of it because you might find one day it's actually, you know, quite valuable. Um, and yeah, I found that the uh, process of like, like it's, it, the other thing is I, I, my process of sound design is a little bit like stone soup. For anybody who doesn't know that fable, look it up. I don't have time to go through it. But essentially, it's like, okay, cool. I throw in this sound, and then I throw in these sounds. And I throw, like, like quite often the first sound that I want. I'm like, yeah, cool. I'll build everything around that. And then I throw in more and more and more and more sounds. And then quite often the original sound that I put in ends up being pulled out because it doesn't fit. But it was the one that got me started in the direction that I wanted to. And so that whole stone soup thing of like, you know, you're, you're throwing a stone and then you're throwing all the vegetables and then you pull out the stone. It, it, it literally is how I, I quite often do things. And I've found that... Sometimes a sound that I thought, well, this might work, but I don't know. When I put it into everything else, I find that, oh, actually, the bulk of that sound has actually been obfuscated by everything else. But why, what I'm getting is this nice high sort of um, harmonic over the top of it, like a, it's almost like a, a, a banshee scream that's standing out. Everything else has been um, lost, but I didn't actually notice that banshee scream when I listened to the original just sound effect because it was all part of everything else. But now everything else is in there and it's fattened it out. It's just that element of that one line. And, and it, you can just get some incredible results by just playing around with things that you just are not expecting, i.e. The, the big spinny, you know, playground wham machine. Um, so, you know, oh, okay, so there's all the processes, which well, I, I don't think I'll go through this. We all know this, layering things together, mixing things, using plugins or not, uh, down mixing. That's our pretty standard process for whether it's doing music production, VO production, uh, sound design production. Th these are the things we do, but these are the things we do with assets. You know, we, we need to make sure that our assets are uh, appropriate and, and are able to deal with all of this sort of stuff. One of the tricks that a, a colleague told me, which he, I really quite liked, he uses Reaper, you can do it with anything, is that because of the same idea of occasionally using older sounds, he actually puts RX in adaptive mode in all of his input channels. So he's throwing in sound effects and stuff like that, and he's just got like a, 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 an RX thing in there. Because what, and I'm like, why would you do that? They're not that noisy. It's like, yeah, but I've got this much headroom. And if each sound is basically, well, well, that's a bit of the sound I want, but there's a little bit of stuff I don't want, and they're all doing that, it's starting to cludge up that, that headroom. And so by putting a filter in, not necessarily every single track, but by putting filters uh, um, RX in adaptive mode in some of your tracks, it just gives you that little bit more, the stuff that's in the mix. You, you're pulling some of the stones out of the soup, and you're left with just the actual ingredients you want, I guess, as a part of extending that analogy. Um, now, for games specifically, most of this happens in real time. So the layering and the mixing and the plugins, there is no down mixing because that all actually happens in real time during gameplay. And quite often, my layering and mixing is actually happening in real time. So I, I, instead of making an explosion out of here's some glass smashing and here's a gun going bang and here's some uh, you know metal being kicked and here's some stones falling over, etc., etc., I will now render those uh, and there's my explosion sound. I'll get those individual elements in the game, 
and they are rendering together in real time as you play it. And, and I'll have multiple glass smashing and multiple guns firing and multiple all these sorts of things. And so every time you trigger that sound effect in the game, it gives you pretty much a unique sound because by the time you've got, let's just say you've got four layers and I've got, say, four to five variations of each layer and then I'm doing a little bit of pitch, random pitch shifting and a little bit of random volume shifting and a little bit of random time slicing around with that. It's not absolutely infinite, but it's very, very, very variable by the time you've actually triggered that lots and lots of times. And it means that in real time when you're playing the game, you're not getting the one sound effect over and over again because repetition is really bad. Um, how are we going for time? When do you want me to shut up? Great. I can give I can give tongue rage. So, so this is the thing with implementation. Naming can differ. Mixing is real time. Multiple takes on demand, and it's audience controlled. And, and th so this is when we're getting into the nitty gritty of, of game stuff. The problem with game stuff is, um, oh, this is going to challenge the camera tracking. If I walk over to the door, can you track me all the way to the door? Ooh, high tech. So, okay, so if this was a film and we had, uh, I'm, I'm talking from a musical point of view, but if this was a film, right, and um, uh, let's just say you, you cliched um, um, Hitchcock film, right, and we know that there's a bad person on the outside of the door. As I move close towards the door, the, the, the music would peak. The music, you'd get that sort of like, you know, dump, 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 dump. And as I open the door, you'd get that because there's a bad person on the other side of the door. The problem with the way that a video game works is a video game actually happens in real time and the player is controlling what's going on. So if I'm now controlling a character and I start walking to that door and the music's building up and building up and building up, I'm going to be like, I'm not opening that door. And so I'm going to walk away from the door. And so the music's all of a sudden like, um, um, but I was building up to a crescendo and you've walked away from the, oh, okay, I have to respond to that. And this is the same with, with everything. You, the, 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 the dynamic nature of video games means that the assets that we are working with have to be far more flexible. So the whole idea of, and I'll go back to the, the thing I started with, that, that annoying camel sound that they used in that nature documentary, it's been used in so many things. Um, the problem with that is if I use that in a game, well, I don't, like, let's just say we have it in the game, it's like when you poke the camel, it goes, Rrr. So, well, but I don't know if the, the player is just going to sit there going tap, 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 tap. Oh, hang on. The camel's saying the exact same one sound over and over and over again. That's annoying. So I basically got to uh, do it so that the camel has a vocabulary. And maybe the, ca the camel's by saying, mm, 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 quit it sort of stuff. And so basically the, the camel can not just react to, so that it's giving you different sounds to avoid repetition, but the camel's actually going, you keep poking me, will you cut it out? And so there's actually an escalation there. And it's really, really hard to predict what players are going to do. Players are notorious for doing literally the last thing that you expect them to do, and quite often something that you think is very, very frustrating. I mean, years ago when I was working on a project, um, and it was a SpongeBob SquarePants game, and uh, one of the artists, a um, uh, very, very lovely man, had like a three or four-year-old daughter, and when she finished at daycare, she would come in, and he'd basically go, here, here's the SpongeBob game. And the SpongeBob game basically started with, there's, there's SpongeBob, he walks outside his house, and then you run off and you do things, and that's the game. Except, when you ran out of the house, there was Patrick, and if you press the X button, Patrick would laugh. Because it was a simple game, and it was just supposed to be like, Patrick sending you on the way by doing a good old laugh. And we had like four or five laughs with Patrick. So she came, and she sat down. She's three or four, and she basically gets this game, and she's got SpongeBob. She spends 10 minutes just jumping up and down with SpongeBob and doing nothing else. And she's just laughing her head off. This is so great. I can make SpongeBob jump up and down. She does this for 10 minutes. Then she discovers that you can interact with Patrick and make Patrick laugh. And that's all she did for the next half hour. She didn't care about anything else in the game. She just like, hoo -hoo, yay, hoo -hoo, yay. And, she just did the, and we're like, we didn't need to build, bother building a game. All we needed to build is a Patrick simulator. And, and I mean, this is a, an extreme example, but it's a really good example of, okay, everybody loves Patrick. We should probably do a whole bunch more with Patrick. You know, because she was just so happy to be able to walk up and poke Patrick and say hello to Patrick. And, and the rest of the game was, was irrelevant to her. So there's this, there's this very big difference between the, the dynamic interactive nature of games 
versus uh, like like um, uh, film and television. Now, having said that, there's an interesting phenomenon that I've been tracking myself with with film and television, um, and I think that, that it, it might be slightly related to the. Uh, you know, remembering the sorts of things you like. So you watch Star Wars and you liked Star Wars when you were a kid or, or whatever. It's slightly related to that sort of, I think it gets referred to as remember berries and stuff like that. Um, but for me, one of the things that's interesting with um, film and television, which is completely linear and it's exactly the same every time you watch it, do not underestimate the impact that you're having on your audience. And I mean that more sincerely than anything else I've said tonight. And I'm going to give you a, an example of why this matters. And I can't even analyse, in fact, you know, I, I could probably find a PhD student who could, uh, sorry, a, a, a um, psychology student who could write a PhD on this. There's obviously things in my makeup as a person, my history, my background, my attitude, my experiences that have led me to being in this position where a certain event a narrative event is significant to me. I, as I said, I won't go into the why, but one of the things that I realised recently, uh, looking back, I'm like, yeah, this was something that I always thought was really, really cool. I always liked the scene, and we've all seen movies. We all know what, we talk, what, what I'm talking about here when I get to it. The traditional sort of thing we get in a narrative, film, television, game, radio plays, theatre, they all sort of do this thing, where our heroes are meeting adversity and generally what happens in like the third act the heroes are usually doing pretty badly. You know, like something really bad is happening to the heroes. They're getting the crap kicked out of them. The, the, the bad guys are winning, etc., etc., etc. And then we get the change. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that almost always that change is heralded in through audio. Uh, I'll give you the, the, the lesser of the two examples first. The, the lesser example is, is from a film that w when I was in the cinema, I'm like, Oh my God, this is so epic. I love this. This is fantastic. And it was a big, huge Hollywood film. And so they can still do that. But it's literally, um, and a lot of, some of you may not have seen this, but in the, the culmination of the Marvel universe, there was, um, uh, Marvel Avengers Endgame. And this had it literally this thing. The bad guy been, has beaten everybody. Everything's gone terrible. We've got two or three of our heroes. You know, we've got Iron Man and Captain America and, and Thor. And they're all falling down. And Captain Marvel basically stands up. And, and literally, the bad guy is there. And he's got a massive army behind him. And Captain, uh, Captain America's just had the crap kicked out of him. His shield's all broken. He's scarred, etc., etc. He's got, like, wounds in him, etc. And he just sort of, he, he sort of stands up. And he just sort of does this tired sigh. And then he tightens the strap on his shield as though, oh, well, another day at work. You know, one of his, his, his ongoing things is, I could do this all day, right? And so he's, he's like, he, he knows he, he, he can't face off this thing. And you get that. And at that point, there's almost complete silence in the theatre. So we think, think giant IMAX thing where we've been having giant fights with superheroes for the last 20 minutes. And now everything's down and it's really quiet. And then we just get this scratchy radio thing. And it's like a, a radio that's kind of interrupted and it's not working. And it's like, cap. And, you're, and he's like, he looks around and he's like, huh. And then you basically hear the voice of a character on your left. And that was the, the, the very line that Captain America gave in a, an earlier film to somebody else when he was just running, around, running laps around them on a athletics track, right? And this person said, on your left. And Captain America's kind of like, wait, what? And then a portal opens behind him. And the heroes start to come through. And the music comes up and it's triumphant. And then more heroes and more heroes. And then after a while, you, you, you know, this, the camera pulls back and there's this, this, this massive army of good guys. And the bad guy's kind of like, oh, okay. Those points... For me, the cavalry arriving points, right? They are significant. And I've watched, I was interesting on that one, I actually watched some reactions to that. There's a lot of reaction videos that are really bad, but when you watch some of the real reaction, the, the legit reaction videos to that, there are people losing their nanas over this stuff because they're people who have been fans of this universe for a long time, right? So obviously it matters to them. The, the personal example for me, again, I wouldn't have even have described myself this way, but I, I realised that I had been a fairly big Star Trek fan for years. And a couple of years ago, they started an animated, a new animated Star Trek show. And it's kind of goofy. And it's like, it's like you know, these people who are just the, the ensigns down below. And they're just kind of doing sort of goofy adventures. But then I started watching it going, yeah, I realise you're playing some of this for jokes. But 
that was a really Star Trek thing you did because you risked your life to save everybody. And so there's this underlying current that is really, 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 we are the small guys, but we're always, we always back each other up and we're always there to help each other. And this particular one is set on what is essentially a mid-level boring ship that's, that goes around and does, you know, not quite garbage cleaning, but it, it literally like they're, 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 they're not heroes. They're not important people. But over the course of two seasons... No, three seasons. We literally have seen them go and help so many. Like they've they've helped giant famous starships left, right, and center. They've helped other characters. They've helped whole worlds. They've done all of these amazing things over the course of these um, three seasons. And then the the end of season three, basically. There's a, a rogue AI that gets out of control and is attacking everybody, and they basically piss it off so that the rogue AI chases them, it's in a spaceship, rather than hurting innocent people. So they run away, etc. And everything's going really, really terrible. Their ship's falling apart. They think they've gotten away. There's actually three AIs. They just managed to destroy two of them, but the last one's there, and they're, 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 they're screwed. They're, they're, their ship is there. It's broken, and the, the rogue AI is about to blow them up, when one of the characters that was on the ship, who'd run away, turns up in his tiny, tiny, tiny little ship. And she's like, no, 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 don't abandon ship. I'll get you covered. And everybody's like, what? You, you, you can't do anything. Like, you, you, you can't do anything on your own. And she's like, no, 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 I called help. And, and then basically it's like, oh, there's another ship turning up. And it's the sister ship to the... So it's another crappy ship. So we've got our, our crappy ship called the Cerritos and another ship's coming that's the exact same crappy ship. And it's like... No, 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 you don't get it. We're a crappy ship. We can't do anything. You know, a, 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 a California-class ship is no good on its own. And she's like, yeah, no, that's why I called all of them. And I'm like, all of what? And then again, the music rises up, and every single California-class ship in the galaxy rocks up. All the characters that we've previously seen, all the ones that the Cerritos has helped over three years of story turn up. And I'm sitting there in tears because for me, and the things that are important to me, this thing presses all the right buttons as far as the cavalry arriving, somebody's got your back, everything's going to be right now, the music is amazing during that thing, right? And it's, and it's really, really cool. But this is the point, right? I've watched that scene multiple times since, right? It came out a couple of years ago because at times, you know, I'm just having a shit day or whatever. And, I'll, and, and that little scene is on YouTube. I can just look that scene up. In fact, it's probably on my phone because I run to that scene. At the end of when I'm doing a run, I literally trigger that scene at the end to get, get me the last sort of half a kilometre. So the people who built that show, they built a good show. They built a show that they thought people would like. Yeah. And the, the, the composer made some music that he thought, you know, people that would go well with it. But that one little scene that's three minutes long is really significant to me. And this is one of the things that we've really got to understand with everything we do from recording our raw assets to the sound design or music composition we're doing to the, the, the vocal directing we might be doing and then all the editing that goes on with that, which can be a huge amount of work, right? We make a thing and unfortunately sometimes we never get to hear how important those things could be for people. So I think it's really, really important that everything we do, we've got to be careful of not just going, oh, yeah, this is just, it doesn't matter, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just get some sounds in there, i.e. the camel sound that was used in the documentary I watched the other day. This is lazy. And I get that they're busy, and I get that we're working hard, and they might not have been given all the time, but, oh, come on, that's a sound out of a, a Series 6000 library. You've done nothing with it. You've just gone, huh, drop, into something that probably had a multi-million dollar budget. And it was just like, even my wife, rec like my wife was the one who actually said it. She said, hang on, that was the camel. I'm like, yes, it was. <laughs> right? So, so even she's recognizing there's a half dozen sound design sounds that have been used quite a lot. And it just, you know. And so the, the care that we take working on things, you need to be careful sometimes not to underestimate. I I've literally had letters from people going, oh, I finally tracked you down. Like I had somebody going, I finally tracked you down. Um, uh, when I was going through um, my placement training as being a surgeon, I used to play this game in my breaks and uh, it was just a mobile phone game and, you know, you did the music for it. Is there any possibility you've got that anywhere? I'd really like to have that little piece of music. And I'm like, there was no money involved. There was no, there was just literally, and I think this is some guy in India who used to play this game. And there was just the opening track that was only like 30 seconds long. And it was really important to him. 
I went to the like I spent several hours trying to find it because it was on archives way way back. Going through that again, but it was somebody who actually cared about something that I did. That was really really nice, you know. And so this is the whole point. There's so much about what we do, and our assets are our palette. Color, tone, texture, light, shade. Those are all terms to deal with visual stuff, but I think everybody in this room would agree that we can apply all of these to, to sound stuff, you know, and to narrative and to how we use them and what we do. Um, and I like thinking of them that way because it, it, it kind of means that I can work with them in sort of new and, and interesting ways. Um, yeah, and I think fluency with the assets. One, one of the things, having all of those sounds, I now know, you know, quite often when I've been looking for other sounds, I go, ooh, I've got to remember that one. And I've got to remember that, you know, impact was a good search term. So now when I, I go back and I'll put in impacts as or cinematic, you know, or, 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 or whoosh or whatever. And so I'm, I, I'm starting to learn how my library is laid out and what keywords and search words are relevant to get interesting results. And so fluency with your assets really, really means that I can get the building blocks faster, which gives me more time for creative work. So, um, I might just shut up and if there's any questions, we'll let other people talk. Talk all night. And then the door creaked open. Yep. And the voiceover man said, any questions? <laughs> There was a lot there to sort through. Um, oh, I'd like to, um, when you're uh, sitting in pre-production, looking at like uh, uh, bringing the sounds in for implementation, do you, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, do, do you randomize uh, uh, sounds like in the door before you bring them into, do, just to sort of test out how sounds might work together, or do you just, just do that in implementation? No, so what I will normally do is, um, uh, a gunshot's a good one because it's a common one within games. I will basically go, all right, so um, I've, I've got a marker just in Reaper, so gunshot for Fred, you know, so Fred's gun, whatever. And then I go, okay, so what's my first layer? Let's just say my first layer is a shotgun. Great, okay, cool. So I'll get a shotgun and I'll have, I'll, I'll just go pop, 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 and I'll like have five of the shotguns. So already I've got five different variations of the shotgun. And then anything else that I look for, any other layers I'm putting in, I'm going to want to have five variations of them. And so already I'm building five different variations and sometimes I might swap them around and I'm like, oh, that layer is really cool. I like that tonal layer because that's going to give it a really interesting. So I'm actually going to copy that exact tonal layer and every gun's going to have a duplicate of that tonal layer, but all the other ones are different. And so what it becomes is that that layer becomes a unifying thing. So uh, depending on how it's going to be implemented, sometimes I might just go, cool, I now have five guns going bang and I might just render those out and pop them into the game and it literally just, it will randomly select from five guns going bang. Or I might go, well, but this is a game that's all about shooting. So shooting is really important. So there's going to be a lot of shooting. So I actually need more um, variation. So what I might do is go, okay, let's just say I, I had nine layers to each sound. What I might do is I might render out the top three and then the next three and the next three. So I've got five and then five and then five. And then what I've got is I've got variations of those five and then those five, and then those five. So now my, my, my number of variations without pitch shifting or volume, uh, re without pitch and volume randomization, instead of having five different sounds, I've got 15. You know what I mean? And so it's, so it's it, well, actually, it's, it actually works out to being far more than that by the time you do all the, the combinations and stuff like that. It's, it's, yeah, it would be a lot more than that. Sorry, maths, I'm terrible at maths. But you get my point, is that it depends on, on what I'm doing with the sound. Um, some sounds, I might just want a single variation, but it's always the same because it's a, it's, it's something that's really important uh, as a, like a warning, bing bong. Oh, right. That sound tells me this thing. You know, it's a little bit like you don't sort of randomize your phone ring every time it goes off. Cause then you'd be like, oh, hang on. Was that my phone or somebody else's? You know, you need to know what your phone ring is. So it d depends on the purpose. So where would you get those shotgun sounds from? From the range or go out duck shooting? Um, so I, am, um, I have uh, the advantage of having access to people in America. Um, I'm a licensed firearms, like I, I've got two rifles. Um, I have people that I could go to in Australia, much more limited in Australia than it is overseas. I'm more than happy to have that limitation because we don't have mass murderers everywhere. Um, but it is like I've got colleagues in America who almost every week are like, yeah, today I'm basically recording a World War II Tommy gun. Oh, tomorrow I'm going to be recording, you know, Clint Eastwood's Dirty Harry. Like, and they can just get access to anything every, all, all the time. Whilst 
professionally that would be useful, I'm more than happy to have the, leg the limitations on firearms here. But if, if I need to, I would record it. Yeah. Questions? Have we got any online questions? Uh, I've, got a, I've got another one. Um, uh, for, for people who are new to game sound uh, and just looking to get started, uh, what do you think, like say if they're just looking for their first 12 months of direction, uh, any advice on how they should go at it in you know, 2024? <laughs> Um, the first thing that they should really do is get involved with the community. There is an organisation organization called IGDA, which is the Independent Game Developers Association. Here in Melbourne, we have IGDAM, Independent De Development in Melbourne. Um, they're on Facebook. They have meetings, uh, I think, once a month where they, there's a whole bunch of game developers who get together. They just, like, literally at a pub, they have a drink, they chat to each other, they show each other what they're doing, and you will meet people there. You don't go up to them and say, hey, do you need a sound person? But you, you meet people and you talk to them about their games and what they're passionate about. It's like getting any gig. You know, you, you've got to get to know people first. But that's actually a really good one. There are, there are regular game jam events where people can learn um, and meet other people. And that's where literally they do. There's no money in that. But there are teams who have made game jam games that have then gone on to be commercially successful. So if you're involved with one of those, that actually could go somewhere as well. Um, those are probably the two easiest sort of entries, you know, to, to put your foot in the water, put your toe in the water, whatever the phrase is. Yeah, anyone else? Okay. Hang on. Hmm. Sorry. Brian, 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 <laughs> you want to? Yeah. As a Thai ABH, I want to what are you going down to that? I'm not doing aeroplanes that much these years, but I did do Tyab for quite a few years as well. Tyab was fun. Um, uh, I, I had slightly more restricted. Down there. I, I had slightly more restricted access to Tyab. The thing about Tamora, so Tamora was the one where I actually was doing the regular one, and they had a celebration. This was a few years ago, quite a few years ago. That was, I think, something like the 60. Fifth anniversary of the Air Force or something, and they basically had this event where they, I think they started at Tamora and then they went around Victoria and ended up at um, Point Cook. Um, and I toured around with them, and oh my god, the content I got from there was incredible. I, I not while I was flying, but I got to sit in a Catalina while they were firing it up and running it, etc. Um, I did get recordings inside a DC3 while they were doing, uh, they were just doing flight tests. Just practicing, like where they touch their wheels down and take off again. Um, they were doing that for ages. Uh, um, oh, one really quick, uh, quick one that's interesting. One of the things I recorded at Tamora at uh, one day, they basically had a RAN um, Bell Iroquois, so the, the Huey helicopter, right? And they were sitting there. They were there for the show, but they were doing some other things. They were doing some tests of their own, and there was nobody else around. And I literally, I've got photos of me literally, like I can touch the helicopter, and I got a whole ton of that recording, right? In 2018, somebody sent me an email asking me to, uh, if I was interested in doing some sound design for them. It was going to go into a small library, and when it all got used, I'd get paid as it got used. I'm like, sure. I didn't have much else at the time. And I didn't really know what was going to happen with that, so I, I did this work for this guy, and I did several hundred sounds, and uh, an, an, an amped-up version of the Huey was in there. The reason why it was amped up is because the whole purpose of these was for Hollywood trailers. So I was told, turn them up to 15. They're going to be really impactful. And I, I didn't hear anything from him. I did it and I didn't hear anything from him for 12 months. And I'm like, oh, it's probably about time I heard from him. And almost like magic, I get an email from him and he's going, oh, I owe you some money. Uh, here's, a, here's a spreadsheet of um, well, your, your sounds that have been used, what they've been used in. And I'm like, what? is this legit? He's like, yeah. Uh, and this is all public knowledge. I'm like, yeah, yeah, these are all out now. And I looked at the spreadsheet and, and ever since, I've got more, more now and, and I, I get these little payment reports and the money's quite nice. But since then... Um, so this is for trailers only, not for the films, but uh, Top Gun 2 trailer, every time the jet flies on in the sonic boom, that's mine. Uh, Fast and the Furious, uh, uh, Walking Dead, couple of Marvel's ones, that RAN helicopter is in, that single sound effect that I put in of that RAN helicopter has probably earned me several thousand dollars because it's been used again and again and again, and I get paid every time it gets used. Um, uh, the, the, the Batman film that was the most recent one, when the Batmobile jumps out of the flame, that's my sound. So I did all these sounds because it was like, oh, this guy wants me to do some sounds. And now 
I get reports every couple of, like, oh, cool, the fire engine in the Minions trailer is my fire engine and stuff like that. And it's funny because I look at these reports and I can almost completely ignore the money. I mean, the money's nice, but for me, especially with somebody who suffers from imposter syndrome, this is incredible. It's like, oh, my God, my sounds were used in the trailer for Dune. Oh, my God, my sounds were used in the trailer for freaking um, Star Wars. My, yeah, it blows me away. But that one helicopter sound, uh, I mean, I, I recorded a whole bunch of ones, but the one that I submitted, I think more than anything else, any time there's a helicopter, it's a Royal Australian Navy Iroquois uh, you know, um, helicopter that's been used in half of the bloody Hollywood trailers. So that was pretty amazing. And a good use of an asset, of a single asset. More questions? Yes, we have a question. Um, in Australia, is there... What, what opportunities, obviously you, you mentioned, you know, how people could start. Is there game, enough game companies in Australia for work here or...? <sighs> okay. So the, the main piece of advice that I give to everybody who asks that question is get out of Australia. And you, it's probably not a surprise to any of you. I mean, the difference between what we have in Australia versus what we have... I mean, if you wanted to work in film and television, you probably should be in Sydney. If you want to work in games, there are... Okay, look, it's not entirely true. We, we actually have some incredible indies in Australia, right? So uh, you may not have heard of these, but Hollow Knight was a, a game that is one of the hugest games. Like, it is, like there's the number two is due out soon, and it's, on most, it's one of the biggest wish-listed games ever. That's made by a team of people in um, uh, Adelaide. Um, so they've done a, an amazing job there. Um, Dredge, which was a really cool game, that was actually made by a group in New Zealand. Um, uh, um, Cult of the Lamb was made by another Australian group, another in Australian indie group. I've just spent the last two years doing two games simultaneously for a group in Melbourne. I'm now working for a group in LA on, on uh, another game. Um, so look, there, there, there is, but there's this many jobs and this many people want to do it. Now, the other thing is, is you could say, well, yeah, but in America there's this many jobs and this many people want to do it. It's like, yes, that is true. But it's a little bit like the story of the, the woman I told you about. Like, if you are hungry and you are prepared to do it, I think people notice that as well. It's like, oh, wow, you moved all the way from Australia to LA to do... Wow, okay, that's, that's commitment that these other people who just down the road haven't shown. You know what I mean? And so that can sometimes differentiate. It's one of the things I heard recently that was really interesting why Australian actors did so well. They were talking about... Uh, Russell Crowe and Hugh Jackman and um, Chris Hemsworth and stuff like that. And they said, what was really interesting about Australians is that quite often in Australian, uh, and, and those three sort of fill that bill, you get uh, male actors they're talking about, male actors who are built like brick shit houses, and yet are eloquent and can talk. And are like, you know, whereas, it, it, sadly, I mean, not all, all the case, but it was definitely the case in the, in the 80s. Half of the big action heroes in the 80s probably couldn't recite the alphabet. They were really big and uh, okay sort of actors and such, but they, they, like, they weren't going to be doing Shakespeare anytime soon. Whereas so many of the Australian actors, uh, Hollywood looks at them and goes, yeah, but you guys can act and you guys can talk really eloquently and stuff like that. And so it, the, the Australians still have a pretty good reputation around the world. Also because Australia hasn't made a big habit of pissing off the rest of the world politically. So we've got a fairly good sort of credit rating on that regard. Um, whereas I think in Australia... Sadly, nobody gives a rat's ass about arts and creativity in Australia. Nobody invests in it. The government occasionally do sort of apologetically, but like in America, there are people who will throw millions of dollars at a film because somebody just wants to make a film and they'll do it as a tax write-off. In Australia, nobody does that sort of stuff. So there's, we, we've got a really, really small creative industry that nobody wants to put money into, which is ridiculous because the game industry has the potential to be one of the biggest money earners on the planet. And yet nobody in Australia really, really cares about it. And, you know, the every time the Conservative government comes back in, they cut back all of the sort of funding that you might have for it. So occasionally you get a bit of government funding. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit tricky on that, that regard. So, yeah, sadly, travel somewhere else. <laughs> Sorry. It's Steve Bodie does. I've got to call out to him. Yeah. The government's just announced a review of uh, university education. Oh, I saw that. And one of the things that they've um, foreshadowed is taking away the problem with arts degrees where um, it costs more to do an arts degree than a STEM degree. How is that going to affect the industry? Um, look, that's a 
really good question. Uh, from my per personal experience, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I know the exact point and the exact age I was when I realised I couldn't do a normal everyday job. Right, Literally, I was in year eight, went to see a film with a friend, and that film was The Dark Crystal. And that film was mind-blowing. The music and sound in that was incredible. Uh, Jim Henson's puppet work was incredible. I was so inspired by that. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I had to do something. I needed to lead a life less ordinary, as they say. Um, and in fact, uh, I'll quote Adam Savage, the guy from Mythbusters recently. He, was, he gave me a quote recently that literally helped me shape what focus I want to do for the rest of my life. He said he was in a room full of people who were super talented. And he said they all had one thing in common. They were all chasing wonder as a life goal. And I went, oh my God, that's incredible. I'm adopting that, right? The problem is, is that I, I, did, a, I did two music degrees, one is an instrumental music, and, and, and you'd have all the bean counters that go, what a bloody waste. It's like, yeah, and I got paid $250,000 in 2020, so is it? Now, I don't get that every year, but my, the point is, is that I'm getting paid a lot more than the average Australian wage most of the time. And from a point of view of, of street cred, and this is the funny thing, the, the, the governments talk about these sorts of things and they sort of don't care about it. But every time Australia does something like, oh, the Matrix was made in Sydney, all the politicians come out of the woodwork really quickly to brag about that. So they love bragging about it. So I think an arts degree costing as much as a tech degree is... Oh. Arts degrees costing more than tech degrees. I've been out of that for... That's insane. On every level, that's insane. Because even, even the example I gave you before is my career has been, the reason why my, I, I, I think I've succeeded is because I've been a little bit like the, the, the creatures in that dinosaur documentary I was watching, the mammals who I'm continually adapting. It's like I, I worked in a studio full time and got really, really taken advantage of and paid horribly uh, um, uh, and treated terribly. But I put up with it because I, I was trying to play the long game. I created sound effects libraries and released those, and they've been giving me passive income, which has allowed me to survive through the lean times. I then had the Hollywood trailers, which is another sort of passive income thing. I've got sound libraries that are dynamic sound libraries that do things in real time on the Unreal store for that sort of stuff. I'm now looking at other options of what I can possibly do to do that sort of stuff. So whilst I might get paid well in some years, other years I don't, um, but I've had to be very, very adaptable. Um, my degree certainly didn't teach me that. So I th actually, if, if they're charging more for an arts degree, that's ridiculous. An arts degree should be much, much, much less because the people who do a coding degree can walk out day one and be earning $150,000. Your, your, your people doing an arts degree will be lucky if they ever earn $150,000. So whichever genius thought that they should be charging more for an arts degree is somebody else that should be shown the door. That's why they're reviewing it. Sorry. I wanted to thank Stefan for what is the uh, inspirational talk that uh, he can give. Um, and I want all the people that are here tonight to also join me in, in thanking Stefan for doing that. I'm sure there'll be a lot of other things going on. We have, after the, the session closes, we have a small token of esteem for you. Oh, thank you very much. That was unnecessary, but thank, thank you very you. much. Much appreciated. And look, thank you. Thank you for asking me here. It's obvious that I talk. Um, but one of the things, no, but part of, the, part of the, the, the motivation behind the passion for me is it's pointless if I keep it in a box. If I share it with people, then it feels like it has a bit more value to, to me, right? So I do appreciate being asked to speak, and I hope, hopefully this has been interesting to people. And we appreciate it too. Thank you very much, Stefan. We've got to give him a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brian.